thank you all for joining me uh, today here uh, for your, your post-lunch fog. Uh, hopefully we can cut through that a little bit. My name is Jason Clark. Uh, I'm a principal uh, engineer and architect at New Relic, which is an observability platform. Um, not gonna talk too much more about observability. This is really a talk about GraphQL and some of how New Relic implements uh, its stuff internally. I do also just wanna give a special shout out to Irene Lopez, who I've previously given this talk with, but she's in Zurich uh, and working for a different company now. So uh, a lot of hard work that she did went into this talk and I wanna give her credit for that. I uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be here without it. So what are we gonna talk about today? So we're gonna cover uh, what GraphQL is, uh, just to make sure that we're all on sort of a similar base of understanding about that. Then we're gonna talk about how uh, you, why you might choose GraphQL over REST. That's kind of the big tension is, GraphQL is an alternative way of doing uh, sort of service calls. And it's, you know, it, you gotta live up to a pretty high bar for people to choose it instead of choosing REST. Then we'll look closely at how to build it in detail down at sort of the code level and how to craft a Java application that conforms to the GraphQL spec and does the work that you need to. And then finally, we'll close with some information, sort of a little bit more opinion and experience from New Relic from running uh, GraphQL services for multiple years and what we've taken away from that experience. All right, so let's start off by just defining what it is that GraphQL is. Um, if you just encountered the term, you might think it has to do with graph databases. It doesn't. It doesn't have anything to do with that. Um, it's also, uh, the QL does give you a hint about where we're actually heading, though. It's a query language. It was designed um, as one of very few things that ever came out of Facebook that I'm actually a fan of uh, to solve uh, some real problems that they had, particularly with their mobile applications. As the uh, company grew and they had more and more different applications following a microservice architecture like many people do, uh, there was this proliferation of calls that had to go out. And that impacts your mobile performance, it impacts your browser performance, all of those things, all of those requests, uh, they cost. And so this was one of the key things that GraphQL was designed to fix. It's designed to make it so that there is a more central position that you can call to minimize requests, minimize payload sizes. We'll talk more about where, uh, about that a little bit later, but that's kind of the fundamental motivation, is taking that proliferation of services that you might have under REST and consolidating it in a way that's easier to manage. Now, GraphQL grew from that starting point and there is an official spec that defines what GraphQL's type definitions and query language are. Um, this spec has been implemented in a bunch of different languages. So if you think, oh, I've heard about GraphQL, that's that JavaScript thing. It's not. It actually transcends many boundaries across programming languages. And given that I'm here speaking at DevNexus about it, unsurprisingly, there's great support for it on the JVM uh, as well. So this is definitely something that's worth us paying attention to as, as an option for how to craft services, uh, particularly that you're going to expose to customers exposed to outside clients. So the first half of the GraphQL spec is really about type definitions. This is one of those things that doesn't exist in REST unless you choose to put your own standards on it, right? You can return whatever sort of JSON you want. You can have your queries constructed in whatever fashion makes sense to you. GraphQL says, hey, we'll get some benefits from putting a type system around that, putting some constraints around how you define both the query side of how you ask for things and the responses that come back. Unsurprisingly, this type system uh, starts from a couple of what we would call primitives in Java. They're called scalars in GraphQL. And so we have ints, floats, strings, booleans, and then an idea of kind of a generic identifier. This can potentially be integers or strings. It could be a, a UUID, whatever it is that makes sense as an ID for you. Um, so those types exist. Those can then be composed into objects. So the type keyword defines a new object type. Here we're defining one that's a movie. It has an ID, it has a title, it has a budget. Pretty basic uh, sort of object shape that you would expect. Now where we diverge a little bit from what we might experience on the JVM, scalars are extensible. And so you can say, hey, I want to have a custom scalar type. 
Uh, one in particular that you see frequently showing up is things around date time and time management because none of that is in the base GraphQL spec. So you can just say, hey, there's a scalar, and then the server will do interpretation on that. So in this case, this might be a, what, ISO 6, uh, 6108 date format. And we can say, hey, it'll come as a string, but we're gonna format that into a date object when we encounter it on the server, and we expect that it'll be valid for that. So you can extend those sort of base primitives in a lot of ways, and you can use them to be very expressive about what your object types actually are. You don't have to pack everything into a string. You can declare scalars that are more, uh, more rich than that. Unsurprisingly, there's support for having arrays or lists of types and objects straight in the box. You just put square brackets around it. That means it's now a list of this type. And here we've defined a second type, review, which we have a list of reviews attached to a movie. It's so, all, you know, anybody who's encountered object-oriented design, this probably makes good sense. It's, it's a pretty basic uh, starting place. Things do start to diverge a little bit from there in your sort of normal type definitions because fields that are defined on our GraphQL objects can take arguments. And so this sort of looks like abstract method calls to some extent, and it gives you a position so that you can uh, add parameters for filtering or add other sorts of data that you need from outside to make sense of this. So in this case, we're saying, hey, when you ask for reviews, you have to give me a score, and I'll only return the things that match that score um, would be the thing, and then it hands back a list of the reviews that match that. Now, this is up to us to define what all of those arguments are, so we have a lot of flexibility in how uh, we can design that system. These GraphQL objects, like, they are all that exist in GraphQL, and so any sort of uh, filtering or any sort of querying that we need is going to be driven through some sort of field like this. Um, fields and various other types can be marked as required by putting an exclamation mark after it, by default, all things are nullable. If you put the bang, then it's non-nullable, both in arguments and in response uh, terms for the object. So you can uh, inform your clients that, hey, you will always get this ID back, but this other field might be optional. Um, we'll come to talk a little bit about where that needs some extra thought and how you design things later on. And last bit that we'll talk about in the type definitions, which is by no means the only other thing, but uh, a common one is enumerations. Um, these are a little bit more like C-style enumerations where they're just a marker, they're not a full class or object the way that they are in Java, but it is good for when you have a, a static list of values that can be represented for something. Um, enumerations come in very handy for that. So with these pieces, we can define an object structure. We can define the map of sort of how someone would interact with our service and what the data looks like that they would get back. So let's talk about how they would actually do that. How would you query and how would you mutate the data through this GraphQL service? Well, it being a replacement for REST in some senses, it's unsurprising that GraphQL works over HTTP. The standard way of exposing it is to have an endpoint Generally, it's slash GraphQL. You will post, or in some other fashion, send your query body to that, and the response that you get back is JSON data. Now, we're gonna dig into those two bolded bits. So what the shape of the query is that we send in has a very tight relationship to what the shape of the data is that's in the response. This is one of the powers that GraphQL buys us. How you get to those queries is that there is what's called a root type. There's actually a couple of them. Uh, we'll see another in a moment. But the root type query is sort of your entry point into the GraphQL schema. So you define type query, and then any fields that you put onto that are sort of like the starting place that somebody making a query is going to ask for. So in our case, we had that movie type that we defined over there. Somebody needs a way to query for a movie, so we provide them with a field you have to pass an ID to it, and it will return you a movie type. What this query looks like in practice uh, is like what's on the left. So this is GraphQL query structure. You have query as the, the keyword up front, and then fields that you ask for, and you'll note that we call out the fields explicitly. 
So this is a key point with GraphQL that there is no wild carding anywhere. You have to be precise and explicit about the fields that you ask for. But you can ask for as many of the fields as you want. If we wanted to look up movie number two, we could just tack that under, we'd need to give it a little rename, but we can ask for anything that we want all in one request, all in one query. And also, along with that, because the fields have to be explicit, that also lets it be that they can be dropped. If there's data that you don't care about, don't include it, <laughs> right? You don't ask for fields that you don't need. Your payload sizes are smaller, depending on the, the environment that that's being consumed from. That's probably gonna help performance. Uh, you pay less network cost. Like, everybody wins by being more precise about the responses on this. This is one of the superpowers that GraphQL has, is it lets you be very precise about the shape of the data that you're getting back in ways that you could do with REST, but there aren't conventions. It's not built in, there's no standard for the way to do that. You'd have to cook it up yourself. With GraphQL, that's all in the box. So query types, things that are off of that query root, um, are meant to be non-site affecting. They're meant to be read, they're meant to be query items, right? Um, obviously, you can't get very far in a system if all you can do is read. <laughs> Eventually, somebody's gotta write some data, and the terminology for that in GraphQL is through mutation. So there is a second root type called mutation uh, at, that, uh, at that level, and we access it in the same way by defining fields. So here we have a field that says, hey, I want to submit a review for a movie. And we're passing in the review to be saved. This, you know, this all kind of makes sense, feels fairly normal for our, our object types. One caveat that is worth calling out at this point, though, that we haven't encountered, our other arguments that we passed so far have just been basic scalars. Here, we're passing an object. And there is a caveat in GraphQL that you cannot pass root types, like our movie type or our review type, to arguments. There is a firm distinction that it makes between input types and output types. And where this comes from is the, myth, the, the philosophical point that GraphQL has is your graph should not be representing your underlying data model. It should not just be a bunch of DTOs slapped over the tables that you have in your database that you've now foisted up into GraphQL. You should be crafting these things to meet the needs of your application. And so they force a separation between input types and output types to kind of encourage you to do the right thing, right? To think hard about like, okay, does it make sense for someone to submit, when you're submitting a review, what makes sense to be in that and what things make sense on the output because those might be different from each other. The object shapes don't have to match between input and output. And so GraphQL kind of not so gently nudges you in that direction uh, with this constraint that it makes. Responses coming back from mutations, because they're just fields defined on a type, it looks exactly like it does from the, the query side. So in this case, review movie and then title are the two pieces of data that we have. Uh, the rest in the middle is the arguments, so those go away and we just see the structure in our JSON over there on the right where it comes out. Now, this is already pretty powerful for giving us a standard way of approaching how we query things and how we write data, but you know, Nothing ever goes completely to plan, right? Errors happen. Errors are a reality and we have to cope with them. And this is something where REST has conventions, uh, but they're pretty blunt, right? Okay, I can return an HTTP 500 because something went wrong, and where do we go from there? GraphQL really embraced the idea that having errors occur is part of normal procedure, and so, the, you may have noticed in those responses that there was a data key at the top. Part of why that data key exists is because there's actually a parallel key that goes along with it, and that's for errors. And these are considered to be standard parts of the GraphQL spec and how things respond. There is always the possibility that there's data and that there are errors represented. Errors have a well-understood base schema that they're required to have. They allow a message, they have locations and pathing that most of the time your library is going to fill in for you. Um, but at base, errors coming back from GraphQL will look like this. You can also extend those errors. 
So this is a powerful thing that you can put your own sort of additional information and classification onto stuff. In this case, uh, for not finding the movie by the ID, we have a specific code. So if somebody wanted to filter the errors that are coming back, uh, we could use these extensions to kind of convey that additional semantic information to them. Now, all of this talk about errors is part of why you will hear people being very angry on the internet about GraphQL, <laughs> right? Because on that prior slide, we got no data back, we only got errors, and yeah, it's gonna give you an HTTP 200. Like, GraphQL responses, regardless of the content, if it has, gets you a response back, it's going to be a 200. And this, you know, this does make some people kind of annoyed, and I get it. Um, the reason that it makes sense, though, and the reason, the thing that we're buying by sort of giving up some of those HTTP status codes is the idea that things can partially succeed, right? With GraphQL, we can ask for many, many different fields. Though each one of those fields is doing entirely separate work that might have a failure or it might be fine. It might get part of the data, it might not. And so the idea of a single status code that represents whether you passed or failed on a given call kind of breaks down in this world where you have potentially a large number of things that are all somewhat independent of each other. So that's my excuse. Like, I buy it enough that I get why they did it. I also understand why, uh, why folks on the internet aren't too happy about it, but uh, that's, that's the reasoning behind it. That's the philosophical point they're coming from. So the GraphQL spec has a lot of other things in it that we haven't touched on here. Um, I will say it's also a pretty readable spec as such things go. So if you're interested in the topic, it's definitely worth exploring that a little more to find out the things that are in the box uh, with it. But let's move on. Let's talk about why you would choose it. And I've kind of alluded to some of these points and sort of this tension of like GraphQL replacing REST. Oh, it's like a big internet fight between the two. And, you know, I think that that's overblown. But I do think that there are cases where GraphQL has some really unique properties to bring to bear. The biggest one is the thing that I talked about first of reducing the number of requests. It makes for a really powerful way to consolidate requests from a client like a web application or a mobile platform. Like GraphQL is designed, um, as we'll talk about a little bit later, to be federated out and broken up into pieces, have the fields work independently of each other. There's a lot of things that are in there to make it easy for you to do a bunch of disparate work and bring it all back together for your clients. So if that's the sort of world that you're living in, GraphQL is potentially a good replacement um, for REST in some of those cases. It can also result in smaller payloads. Um, this is particularly pertinent in mobile settings, um, but being able to precisely request the data that you're after um, is a really powerful um, sort of technique that's hard to do in REST uh, consistently. For us at New Relic, we found that this also promoted API growth as something that, uh, that happened more naturally once we moved to GraphQL. There was a big push that we wanted to be API first. We wanted everything we do to be exposed through an API. But when you had to stand up your own new REST service and you had to define what the routes were for it and then you needed to do the documentation and then you needed to make sure it was doing authorization, like there was a lot to getting something to the point that we could put it in front of customers. GraphQL now gives us a very easy point to be like, oh, hey, we have a new product area that we want to make an API for. Add a field. <laughs> Add the data that belongs with it under it. And so it really smoothed the path for us to continually grow that API and schema very naturally with fewer roadblocks for our teams as we were going. As part of that, we avoided sort of the restful explosion of endpoints that tended to happen before. Um, we were already in a state when GraphQL came in where we probably had at least a half dozen different sort of major RESTful APIs owned by different teams with different shapes. Some of them had, you know, open API swagger documentation. Some of them didn't. They all kind of worked a little differently. Um, and GraphQL gave us a good point to sort of cut that growth and explosion off, which makes things so much more discoverable for our customers. It's so much easier for them when we're like, hey, you want to use our API? There's the API, not 
oh, well, are you doing infrastructure or are you doing application monitor? Like, nobody wants to have to figure out which API to call uh, from that. And as I mentioned in, in that prior spiel, there is an amount of GraphQL as well that is self-documenting. The schema itself has the ability to attach descriptions and comments onto the various fields, and then those allow really nice natively built-in tooling for people to be able to explore that schema. With a RESTful system, like you can do it with things like OpenAPI, but you have to choose and manage and bolt those things in. With GraphQL, that sort of documentation just comes out of the box. It's like part of how the system is built to work, that it has those self-describing properties, which is really nice. It's nice for the right thing to be easy for teams rather than the right thing to be, oh, go add this extra library and do this whole extra process as part of your work. All right, that's a lot of abstract notions of what GraphQL is and a bunch of reasoning why I think it, uh, it's interesting and sometimes makes sense. Let's take a look at some code. Let's see how you would actually build a GraphQL service. Well, as I alluded to, there are many, many different implementations of GraphQL um, on the back end across multiple different languages. We're fortunate in Java that we have basically one really good, solid, high quality option that is um, very cleverly named GraphQL Java. Um, it's pretty much the one that's out there and anything that you see is very likely to be built on top of that. Um, their documentation is excellent, um, gets you up and started, so if you wanna pick it up yourself, I definitely recommend that you get over there, but we're gonna walk through a little bit of the mechanics here today and talk through it. So the first point is, you know, when we get started with GraphQL and we're gonna make a new service, right, we do need something to serve that over HTTP. We need that GraphQL endpoint to exist somewhere out in the universe. And although I acted in the earlier slides like querying over HTTP is just like, oh, that's totally standard and normal. It's standard and normal, it is not actually part of the spec. The GraphQL spec actually only defines the query language and the type system and says nothing about the transport and how that actually happens. Now, there's work ongoing to remedy that, to take all of the conventions that have developed in the ecosystem for how to do HTTP calls, because there is a little bit of flavor to it. It's like, well, do you post a body or do you do a get with query string parameters? Is that body some special format or is it JSON? Uh, what's the JSON look like precisely to do these things? So there's, there's some nuance to how you serve things over HTTP that really, it's kind of a loss that it didn't get specified in the first place, honestly, and I feel like they're, they're coming back and patching gaps. Now, the vast majority of you, uh, from all the data and things that I'm aware of, probably interact with Spring and Spring Boot. If you do, there is an excellent uh, integration for hooking in uh, in that ecosystem, and I totally would recommend that you take a look at this. I'll be honest, though, like I, ha I don't use Spring a lot in uh, my day-to-day -day job, and so we ended up having to do a little bit of work ourselves because we wanted to use Drop Wizard. Uh, Drop Wizard is a very basic sort of web framework uh, based on Jetty and Jersey, and it's kind of, for historical reasons, is sort of one of the norms at New Relic that like we do uh, for our services. And so this gave a nice viewpoint of being able to see kind of what the layer below needs to be like to make this happen. So let's take a look at how that goes. So in a Jersey application, uh, your HTTP endpoints are defined as resources. That's the, the naming convention on the classes that we have. And so we need to create a GraphQL resource. That GraphQL resource is going to get a GraphQL object handed into it. Now this GraphQL object that's coming in, this is what comes from the upstream library. This comes from uh, GraphQL Java, and it's essentially the engine for evaluating GraphQL queries. It has your schema loaded, it knows how to run the various bits of code uh, that it needs to run. That's like the center of your universe. And so this resource is just kind of wrapping that engine and giving access to the outside world to it through an HTTP in interface. That HTTP interface uh, from Graph the GraphQL uh, resource, all of its responses are gonna be in JSON, so that's standard and we just set it at the root path. And here we can see our constructor taking that engine in and holding on to it for us to use later. And then each of the GraphQL uh, routes that we want to support, we ask it you know, to put that on a certain path. 
and it's gonna take some sort of data. Now there's a number of different flavors. I've shown one of the most basic forms of it here, which we don't actually use that much, which would be passing things through query string parameters. Um, you can imagine that there's a JSON form of this, which would take a body payload, and then it would uh, deserialize that. There's a form where you can send the GraphQL queries as bare object, like bare GraphQL uh, with a content type. Um, and so there's a couple of different varieties that we needed to support with this, but not too many. Um, and basically each of these hands off at the execute method there to the GraphQL engine, hands it the, the arguments and the things that we get from the outside, and the response out of that engine is a pile of JSON that we just send back down the wire. So there's very little processing that needs to happen at this level. Most of the hard work, all of the query evaluation, happens in the library code that we're, uh, that we're bringing in from GraphQL Java. So that brings us to our next step. I kind of hand wave there, oh, we get a GraphQL object from somewhere and it's all loaded and it knows our schema and it knows how to do uh, the work that it needs to. This is the stuff that comes from that core library from GraphQL Java. Um, we did end up making a little bit of a wrapper around it. And this is an open source library that's available from, uh, from New Relic that sort of has a couple of helpers that we found useful in uh, doing a lot of this sort of schema wire up and, uh, and mapping. The library is great, like it gives you all the options, but it has all the options. And sometimes we don't care about configuring every single parameter of every way that we could possibly make some of the things work. And so that's a lot of what this library is focused on is, is finding the simple path to doing uh, the most common sorts of operations and making that easier for us to do. So how this looks for us to be able to build our GraphQL engine to go run, we have a, a root class called the simple GraphQL builder. We're gonna hand that a reader and that's gonna contain the schema. So that will boot up and there's some amount of processing that it does on those types. It reads that uh, schema definition file the way that we looked at it and sort of the type definition uh, part of the time. And then at the end, when we hit build, that's gonna return us our GraphQL object, that engine that's the center of everything. Now, at this point, okay, it knows about our schema, but it doesn't know our code. Like, how does the GraphQL engine know what to do to fulfill a certain field? How does it know what to, what to look up? And in the parlance of GraphQL Java, these are called fetchers. Um, now, if you read in other broader uh, GraphQL communities, almost everybody else calls them resolvers. So I have no idea why they diverged on the terminology there, but if you read you know, about Apollo server or whatever and it talks about resolvers, know that those are fulfilling the same thing that fetchers are in GraphQL Java. When we, uh, when we call to this fetcher method uh, to, to wire things up, we give it a type. In this case, we're giving it the root query type we give it a field name, movie, like we saw in our schema, and then we hand it a class. That class implements a data fetcher interface, and we'll see it in just a second. And this is all the binding that we need to say, hey, anytime somebody queries for movie, here's the class that you hand off to for it to do the actual work. We can uh, associate a fetcher to fields at any definition level, though. This isn't just at that top level query. The query type is not actually special. It's just a GraphQL type. And so here we can see for our movie type, we've wired a different fetcher onto it if you ask for the reviews. So this is useful if say part of your object structure just comes straight out of the database, but then part of it you need to go look up in another service. Well, you only want to do that service work if somebody's asking for that field. And so by doing this, we can isolate the work uh, to just the requests that actually need it. And if you don't request reviews, then we'll never actually execute that in the course of a, a request. So it allows us to be more precise on the back end about the work that we do to get it done. All right, so let's take a look at the implementation of that fetcher. How do we actually wire that together so that we get the data back? First off, uh, we have just a fairly standard data object that is going to be our response. Now this aligns very much to what we saw in the GraphQL definition. We'll talk a little more about that in a moment or two. 
Um, but the GraphQL library knows very well how to deal with all the standard conventions for object types. So if you follow bean naming for your objects, when you hand a movie back, it's gonna serialize it properly to, uh, to JSON that aligns to the spec. You can also return primitive types um, in simpler classes, like you can hand back a hash map with field names and values. I don't know why you would want to do a lot of that. <laughs> it seems like not having a class to wrap things would uh, make life a little more difficult down the line. But you can take your objects, and so these response objects are the sorts of things that our fetchers are going to hand back. So data fetcher is the core interface uh, that fetchers need to implement. And in this case, we're using the type parameterized version that says, hey, I'm gonna hand you back a movie. This implementation only has uh, one method on it, and that method is get. The get will return the type that you told it the data fetcher was going to return, and it takes in this data fetching environment. Now that is kind of like everything about the request and about the processing from the GraphQL engine. If you've got complicated deep nested fields, it will tell you like where in the chain of things you're at. It has all the arguments, all the things that are being passed in. Uh, so this is sort of like our, our request context uh, that we're looking at here. So in our case, remember, if you remember back, we said with the movie field, you pass an ID so we can retrieve that argument out of our environment, turn it into an integer, and in this case, we're just handing it off to a movie service to go do the lookup. Now, I consider that fairly good practice. Um, fetchers, in a lot of ways, like if you squint at them, they're a lot like controllers in an NBC sort of setting. They should not probably be doing tons of work. They should be doing coordination. They're about bridging between the incoming GraphQL data and who's going to fulfill that. They probably shouldn't be you know, making SQL queries directly themselves. Those should be delegated off to other sorts of systems. So the fetchers are really the glue that, hold, that holds things together there. And with that, we have a functioning system. At this point, this would be able to return those movie types and respond to the queries that we had defined earlier, and it's good, and it, and it works. But, you know, there's something that bugs me about it, and there's, you know, standard programming dogma to not repeat yourself, right? Don't repeat yourself. Um, and we already said our types in our GraphQL schema, and then I had to go write this Java class to do the same thing. And that sucks. Um, there's a number of different ways that people look to, uh, to deal with this. Uh, one approach takes annotations and marking up in your Java code and then generating schema back from that um, as one possible way of doing things. At New Relic, because we're a polyglot company and we have a lot of consumers of our GraphQL who aren't necessarily Java programmers, going the other direction worked better for us. So having an explicit schema file that lays out what the GraphQL schema is and everybody who talks GraphQL from whatever language understands that schema and turning that into the Java code. So we came up with uh, a little plugin that does some of that work. Now, this has not been open sourced, mostly from a lack of my time. Um, so I'm gonna show you what it is. If there's interest about this, poke me, because that might give me the motivation to go through the rest of, uh, rest of the work to try to get this out. But the, the generation that it does is actually pretty straightforward. So it reads the schema file that we have, and then every named type turns into a class. Every field, if it doesn't take arguments, turns into a field that's on the object with a normal accessor. Like, you can, you can squint at that GraphQL and imagine exactly the Java code that you would want to write from that. The one tricky little bit with it is what to do with arguments, right? So at the point that you have a field, but it takes arguments, like that's not really quite a field in the Java sense anymore. This is more like a method or in GraphQL parlance, this fits really well as a fetcher. Like we can put a fetcher at that level, wire it to that field, and it can take and know the arguments that it's supposed to get. And so if you remember before, we had our movie fetcher and it was previously uh, having to grovel around in the arguments and pull the ID out and turn it into various pieces. Well, with this generated code, we are able to 
generate base classes for those fetchers that know the parameters, and instead, we now get to override a very nice method that takes all the arguments that our GraphQL schema defined. These are completely optional. If you don't wanna do that, and it makes more sense for you to write your own fetcher from scratch, nothing about this generation says that you have to use that base class. But it's convenient to come along if it does. We can really see that showing if we take a look at our mutation, which has actually a lot more going on of that sort of mapping. So in the original flavor of it, written like we did our other fetcher a moment ago, you would have made a data fetcher. Uh, mutations are implemented by fetchers, the same as queries are. But we have to go all over in that argument hash and grab different parameters out and hand them back and forth. And it's like, this has already been defined elsewhere. So with that code generation, we're able to just say, hey, make a review input for me out of the stuff you'd have coming in, hand it to me. And then we can proceed from there. This is a great simplification uh, for a lot of the really boilerplate code that you end up writing to keep your schema and your Java in sync. Um, it's been a big win for the teams that, uh, that they don't have to write that stuff by hand and manage it. So how did this turn out? Like this is a, you know, a pretty big transition for New Relic that happened a, a number of years ago, adopting GraphQL in this way. Um, as I think I might have mentioned, uh, we, we follow a federated approach with it, which I'm not gonna get too far into the details of here. Um, but there is a central sort of service called NerdGraph that is our primary entry point into GraphQL. And this is what gets consumed from both our UIs, any of our integrations and CLIs that we run, and our customers have direct API access to it as well. And so that goal of being API first is really coming true with this because everybody uses those same methods to be able to get to it. Um, because of various historical reasons and, and uh, some of the polyglot nature of things at New Relic. NerdGraph is actually implemented in Elixir, um, which there's a very small number of teams at New Relic that are really diehard Elixir fans, and almost everybody else writes Java. And so this federation model has actually worked out really well, because what we've done is we've said, hey, you write a GraphQL service in whatever language you want, and NerdGraph knows how to call that service and stitch the responses in to the place that it's supposed to be. So this has given teams freedom to write, write things. I know that there are a couple of Ruby clients, there are or a couple of Ruby services, there are a few Elixir ones, but by far and away the most uh, common implementation language for GraphQL services at New Relic is Java uh, these days. So some of the things that we've done along the way um, and that we've learned about with GraphQL, I would start with saying like it's been a valuable thing for us to really embrace the constraints that it brings. Um, there are things that when you come to GraphQL from a RESTful background, you might go, oh, that's weird, or I hate that, right? Error handling is the immediate one, that like everybody's angry that I took your status codes away. And sometimes teams have like gone so far as to embed status code values back into their schema trying to like regain their former glory for, uh, for what they were missing there. Um, you know, while I get the pain, there's a lot of value in embracing what the platform is meant to do. And GraphQL means for you to model your errors through its error system and through the extensions that it provides there. And we've actually had some really big wins from this. This has allowed us to actually solve a problem, which was that a lot of teams were exposing error information that they probably shouldn't in their error messages. It's really easy to do. You throw an exception, it's got SQL in there. And if you don't quite handle things right, it percolates through the levels and then our customers see what our table layout is. Nobody really wants that. Following these principles and embracing the constraint of how GraphQL does error management, we were able to come up with a standard pattern that says, hey, if you don't provide this, like you can provide a customer message, but if you don't, then you're going to get standard messaging and those errors are kept and retrievable for New Relic personnel. And so we can see the things for diagnostic purposes, but our customers don't end up getting the nitty gritty details that they really shouldn't. This is, comes from us embracing what GraphQL wants us to do. Similar things happen uh, with the typing. So GraphQL really, really, really wants you to type everything out explicitly. 
but every once in a while, like it is, there are use cases where you want some flexibility. So like a lot of times, objects want custom attributes that are gonna be provided, and you don't know what those key values are, right? You can't just put them as fields on the object because they're not known until later. And a lot of teams would sort of reach for, oh, I need to have a, a raw JSON object. Just like, stop being GraphQL and dealing with fields there and everything below this is just a JSON blob. Well, that works and you can get there, but like in this case, that's not actually really correct, right? A JSON type, it could be an object, it could be an array, it could be a string, it could be a number. It's not just a list of custom attributes, right? And so embracing the idea that you be precise about the types and say, hey, I'm going to make a scalar type that is custom attributes, and then that will have additional constraints on it. It also communicates more. It communicates what's really going on with it, rather than fighting against the platform that wants you to be specific to try to you know, jam a, an opaque blog into the middle of it. The next thing that we've learned a lot about is evolving. Um, one of the big promises with GraphQL is that it gives you different tools than what you got in REST for being able to evolve. Uh, standard wisdom with RESTful APIs is like, okay, if you need to change something uh, significant about the shape or return of your data or how it behaves, make sure that you put a version in your path and then version up, right? I need to add a field, okay, now that's v2, now that's v3. And man, doing that with external customers sucks because <laughs> they have to change their code, they have to change their paths, they have to upgrade. And the reality is that you end up with this long tail of versions that you have to keep working because somebody somewhere is potentially calling it. GraphQL, it's not a silver bullet, but it does provide a path for some of that sort of evolution in ways that, uh, that REST doesn't. And particularly, you, you have to let go, the trade-off is, you have to let go of that sort of strict versioning mentality and design things for addition. Adding fields is basically always safe in GraphQL because the queries have to be explicit. With no wildcarding, if you don't ask for a given field because it didn't exist, you don't care that it exists now. And so I can put new things into the schema and evolve it in that fashion pretty much seamlessly without having to worry about breaking collars. Now, there are still sharp edges. Um, one example of that is required versus optional. If you had something on input that used to be optional and now you want to make it required, you broke your collars. Uh, similarly, if you have an object that you've said this is non-nullable, like it's always going to be there, and then you change that to be optional, you might have broken your collars. And so thinking hard about what things you make required and optional on the two sides of that uh, is, is a discipline that you have to get into in designing those GraphQL schemas. Similarly as well, one versus many. If there's a possibility that something in your schema eventually might have multiple instances, even though it already ha it just has one today, you might wanna consider making that a list type to begin with um, and making it so that that type change doesn't have to happen later. We've invested a lot at kind of our central levels around automated linting of schema uh, for some of the, these sorts of problems. And so when you're PRing things in, a bot will look at your schema and be like, hey, you made something required that wasn't before, that's gonna break consumers. Here's how we need to look at whether that's a safe change for, or a change that we're willing to make. Are, are we willing to risk that breakage? And that really comes to this final point that we lean heavily on instrumentation for that. And so every field that's in use in our GraphQL schemas, we have tracking that tells us how often those are getting used. And they have to get below certain levels before we're willing to allow things like changing a field in a breaking fashion. Now, if you're in early development, we don't get strict about it, but like, if something's gone out in the wild, we don't want our customers' queries to break. And this is part of how we can protect against having our, our customers uh, get a bad experience using our, our system. Last but not least, in, in all of this time and having dozens and dozens of these GraphQL services, we found a lot of common patterns. And we've been able to share a lot of that knowledge between teams. Um, it's allowed us to kind of think really heavily about our data model and how we expose that to customers. And 
making sure that we follow consistent patterns in how we evolve that and have a consistent vocabulary around the objects and the things that are central to our system. Um, that's worked out really well, I think, for making an API that while not perfect, because nothing is perfect, is a lot more self-consistent uh, than the uh, RESTful APIs that we had before. Other things kind of happen at a more of a code level, like I mentioned the safe error handling and the fact that following the same patterns around that was really a powerful leverage point. We've also been able to do things around pagination, which is an extremely common concern that you run into. If you're returning thousands and thousands of objects, like you need a way to paginate those results to protect your service. Um, and because we all have this sort of central place that we're coming to and this central service for providing that, it's been a really, uh, a really great spot to find out more about uh, how other teams do it and share that knowledge. So that's where we've been today. Um, we talked about what GraphQL is. We looked at how to build with it. We looked at uh, some of the trade-offs and why you might choose it and then a few things that New Relic's learned. Um, hopefully this has been informative for you. Um, unrelated to GraphQL, um, I have recently had these two books come out with my uh, friend and co-author Ben Evans, who's in the room. Um, so there is a discount code for the well-grounded Java developer if you're interested in digging deeper into the JVM. Sadly, doesn't mention GraphQL uh, much at all. We don't kind of deal a lot at that level, but uh, I, I don't know, I think it's a pretty good book anyways. Um, and I have a couple of, uh, I have three uh, dis, uh, free ebook codes. So the first three people that are gonna ask questions will get those. And last but not least, in uh, 20 odd minutes uh, at 2.45 at the Red Hat booth, we actually have a few physical copies of the books that we will be giving away as well. So with that, thank you for your time and uh, who, who wants to ask a question? Uh, yep. So the question was, uh, what's sort of the comparison between SOAP and GraphQL? Um, I mean, I think that there's a little bit of, of similarity there in some of the, like, central position of schema and some of the ideas with code generation. Um, GraphQL is much, much lighter. Um, I feel like the, the amount of toil that you go through to fulfill the GraphQL part of things is a whole order of magnitude different from the bad old days of SOAP. Um, so I don't know, I think it, to me, it feels like it, it retrieves some of the helpful schema parts of putting a little more rigor around your data without uh, causing too much complexity. Um, that would be my, my thought. Next. Yeah. Our last project we had kind of a choice between we go with the traditional REST API or uh, GraphQL. And one of the trade-offs was with, with REST you can kind of control how, when, how the queries are crafted by either uh, somebody external to your organization or like how they're going to query the objects. Yes. Um, what kind of provisions like you know, running this at scale did you run into to make sure that you're not getting like that N plus one? Yeah, so the question is uh, with REST, you can often have more specific control over precisely what queries are going to happen. Um, and GraphQL, rightfully so, is designed to make that more wide open. And so you have less certainty of what queries your, uh, your individual customers are going to make. Um, so we definitely deal with that at New Relic. Um, some of it we do work where we look at the overall like size of the queries and the nature of what's in the queries. Um, there's also protections kind of at each level. So even the stitching out to the various services, those have sort of thresholds that they're allowed to consume. Um, I will admit that it's a hard, it's a really hard problem though, because you can make an innocuous looking GraphQL query if you design it right, that's gonna have three fields, so it doesn't look like much, but it explodes into a gigantic nest of pain. Um, I think by and large practices that we've done around parallel computation, which that's part of, you know, it could be done in Java, but where Elixir served very well in that, uh, that portion of the system. And then individual sorts of thresholds and controls around the services have made it manageable for us. Uh, but yeah, it's a very real peril that you don't know what people are going to query 
even people from in your own organization, in our case, we do it to ourselves uh, on occasion of the UI crafts up some new query and it does not perform the way we thought it was going to. Um, yeah, very, very normal, so. Cool? Yes, yeah, so streaming data, that's an excellent question. Uh, there is one other uh, top level root type, which is subscription. Um, and the subscriptions are meant to be returning streaming data. Um, we've used that a little bit. Uh, it hasn't been sort of central to our usage of it very much, but it uh, would allow you to put, push things back over server sent events or web sockets or uh, probably with HTTP2 there will be some, some support there. I don't know a whole lot more past that. Um, we have a pretty basic implementation of it in like one little corner, um, but that is, that is available as a thing uh, within the spec. Yes. So one question about uh, debugging through GraphQL. Um, one thing that I've seen that's been a difficulty in our company is that for certain REST endpoints, you know, when you want to debug going from the control layer down, you can kind of see the whole MVC implementation easily yep. and find where certain performance things are happening. But GraphQL, whenever we're trying to do from like a data fetch environment, sometimes it's kind of hard to figure out exactly where certain things are getting held up. And uh, do you have any opinions or experiences on how you work through debugging certain issues with performance or mm -hmm. finding little bugs other than just having that error bubble up? Yeah, so for, for us, that's like, you're totally right that like it sort of takes away some of that certainty that you had with REST where you hit a given endpoint. Um, we've had a lot of success being New Relic at using tracing, uh, distributed tracing sorts of technologies for doing a lot of that. Um, and our APM agents as well, like are able to sort of, you enter at the top level and that sort of becomes the transaction and then you can clearly see all the fetchers and everything that it does within that context. Um, so that's been sort of our main tool for it is that um, our observability that we already kind of have from our APM level uh, handles most of that within the service and then if you cross the boundaries of sort of like where we're calling between GraphQL services, um, distributed tracing allows you to sort of look at that. Um, Tools that help with distributed tracing that we can cross the boundaries? Um, well, New Relic does distributed tracing uh, as a product. Uh, in the open source realm, it would be uh, open telemetry um, and Jaeger probably as a back end these days. Um, is is the, the top leader in the open source world for it. But yeah, it's like that sort of tracing is exactly the sort of thing that's harder in GraphQL, but well supported by a lot of the modern tracing tools. Yes. Is there any built-in support for client authorization? So for example, maybe certain clients aren't allowed to get the data not held on the media that they request. <laughs> Others are. Yeah, there is, so I wouldn't say that there's anything built in directly. Um, I, there, are, there is support in the GraphQL spec and in the library for things that are called directives, which I didn't really show, where you can sort of annotate different parts of the schema with things that are of interest. We've used that specifically to say, hey, this particular field requires this capability in our RBAC system. Um, and then that checking gets done at runtime on a query to make sure that someone's allowed. So like there's nothing, I, I would say that there's nothing in the box uh, per se, but the p necessary pieces to build it are, are pretty evident uh, once you start digging into it. Yep, very true. Uh, we are using schema stitching, and it's our own kind of homebrewed version of it. No, I mean, part of it is that we were doing this long before that stuff even came along. Um, and so the, the biggest part of how we end up managing the stitched schemas is that we actually have a relatively restrictive set of points in the primary schema where people are allowed to add things. Um, and so there's a process by which you, internal tooling, you say, hey, I would like to register this GraphQL endpoint. There's some namespacing that it does to figure out the field that it's going to land into that. And so it's, we, we get away with it largely by constraints that we put on ourselves. It's not like an open-ended, oh, you can stitch at any point because that's a way harder problem than it seems like on the surface. <laughs> yep. Yeah, 
that's, and that's one of the things where the way that we're doing it, by being very constrained, we can avoid most of those problems. Um, so, yep. All right. Well, I think that's probably good. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, do feel free to track me down. And the folks who uh, got in first, you can come up and I'll make sure to get you your codes. So, thank you.